Hi. In this one, I'm going to talk about five little things that I care about in everyday Rust code that aren't really meaty enough to merit a whole video each. We're going to go pretty fast, so buckle up. Number one, when you write code in a block in Rust, you can put an expression at the end without a semicolon, and that expression is used for the resulting value and type of the whole block. If you don't want your last expression to do that, you put a semicolon after it, and then the value and type of the block is just unit. So this raises an interesting question. If the last expression in your block already has type unit, should you put a semicolon after it or no? Well, my stance is that it depends, but it matters, and you should think about it. Consider a function a that returns unit and a function b that calls a. Should b put a semicolon after its call to a? Well, if it doesn't, then what b is saying is, I return whatever a returns. And so I return unit because a returns unit. But if it uses a semicolon, b is saying, I return unit regardless of what a returns. Imagine if the return type of a changed to i32. If b didn't use a semicolon, this would become a compiler error since the body of b is now returning a different type than its signature says. And that might be what you want, especially if b is meant to be a fairly thin wrapper around a. The compiler will guide you to fix b if a ever changes. On the other hand, if b returns unit because b should return unit, regardless of what a returns, use a semicolon to visibly intentionally discard the return value of a, even in the case where it happens to be unit right now. Number two, sometimes you have a type name that's long. Sometimes it's an enum. Many times you want to match on all the variants in that enum, but it's pretty annoying to have to write out the type name in every arm. It might be tempting in this situation to just use all the variant names using a wildcard right above the match so you can use them unqualified. Never do this. Never do this. Look what happens if you later come along and remove var c. Now, this pattern creates a variable called var c that is a catch-all pattern. Now, when you compile, you might get a warning about an unreachable pattern, but you will not otherwise know that this has happened. Even worse, if you come along and re-add a new variant with a different name, the var c pattern is no longer unreachable. It will match var d and any other variants you add in the future. And the best diagnostic you'll get now is a warning that var c has a non-snake case name. All along, you probably wanted the compiler to guide you to this match statement to fix it once you removed var c. This wildcard destroyed the compiler's ability to do that. Rust is so well designed, this is one of very few genuinely scary foot guns that I'm aware of that you can easily run into in everyday code. What you should do instead of using wildcards is just alias your type to have a really short name and use that in your match arms. Number three. I made an entire video about why you should never use immutable references to options and should always prefer optional references. See that video for the full explanation, but the advice actually doesn't stop there. The same exact reasoning can be applied elsewhere. For instance, never use immutable references to vec, always prefer a slice. Or ref string, always prefer a string slice. Or reference to box, always prefer a reference to t. In short, never return an immutable reference to the container you're using to hold something when you can return a reference to the thing itself. This makes your APIs more flexible and better abstracted. This actually goes beyond Rust and into other languages too, although sometimes it's not as straightforward and sometimes the names are too long and don't fit in the frame. Number four, I worked in code bases where it was common to write APIs like this, namely returning impl into something instead of the thing itself. The best word for APIs like this is silly. When you write this function, all your caller can possibly do is call into on the return value to get the string out. That's all you've told them they can do. You end up with calls to into at every single call site, which is pointless source code overhead as well as possible binary overhead. Just call into inside the function and save your caller and the compiler the trouble. This applies to the into trait, but also into iterator, or really any trait that has just one method that moves out of self, including traits you write. These types of traits make bad return values, although they're great for parameters to make your APIs convenient to call. The mnemonic is that they're good for passing into functions, although beware of monomorphization overhead if your function body is complex. You can use the inner function trick to extract the bulk of your function into non-generic code that operates on a concrete type. By the way, never put a semicolon here. Think about it. Think about this too. Does what I just said apply to this trait? It only has one method that moves out of self. Does it ever make sense to return one of these? Why or why not? 
This last one is about the unsafe keyword. Now, hopefully you're writing unsafe code responsibly and or rarely, but if and when you do need to write it, note that the keyword unsafe has two very separate meanings. In front of a block, it allows you to write unsafe operations in that block, but in front of a function, it marks that the function must be called from an unsafe block. These are sort of related, but also fairly distinct meanings. This one says, you must uphold a special contract in order to safely call this function. Whereas this one says, I promise I have upheld the contract, so let me call the function. Funnily enough, unsafe is maybe the wrong word to use in this case, since what you're actually saying is that you promise the code in the block is safe. Anyway, this keyword has two meanings, which by the way, also map nicely onto unsafe traits and unsafe impulse respectively. And that's all fine, except by default, the language conflates the two. The body of an unsafe function is also implicitly considered to be an unsafe block. You're allowed to do unsafe operations anywhere within unsafe functions, no questions asked. This is a mistake in my opinion. There's a lynch that you can add to your crate that irons this out and requires you to wrap unsafe operations in unsafe blocks, even inside unsafe functions. Your unsafe code should use this. After all, Rust promises that all undefined behavior can always ultimately be traced back to an unsafe block. When you find yourself debugging undefined behavior, you'll thank yourself for making your unsafe blocks as small as possible. There's an open tracking issue for this lint with lots of interesting discussion on it. Link in the description. Spoiler, many people agree with me, but not everyone. And some of those who disagree are respected authors of libraries that feature lots of unsafe code. I encourage you to read more and form your own opinion. So that's all five. To review, think about your semicolons in unit blocks because it matters. Never use enum variants with a wildcard pattern because it will lead to bugs. Never use immutable references to vec, string, and box because they never make sense and make your APIs worse. Don't return impl into t because it's silly, but do use it for parameter types. And use unsafe blocks and unsafe functions. These are five opinions of mine. I can't wait to hear yours in the comments. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.